If you're in the mood for dark and scary with a touch of irony, there's nothing better than to sit back and watch your favorite stories on the big screen or even the little screen. Today, we're going to talk about Netflix's Fall of the House of Usher by Mike Flanagan. But how does it compare to the original stories it represents? What are the Easter eggs? Let's look at each episode by title and see how it shapes up to the story written by the master of macabre himself, Edgar Allan Poe. Episode 6 is titled, The Gold Bug. Although we'll point out throughout this commentary, the episode has much more in common with Poe's story William Wilson than it does with The Gold Bug. The episode begins with Tamerlane preparing for her presentation for her new product, The Gold Bug. She hasn't slept and is pacing around the house, frequently losing track of large chunks of time due to insomnia. She even sees someone out of the corner of her eye, someone that looks strangely like herself, a reference to William Wilson, where the protagonist sees a doppelganger of himself. Tamerlane is hallucinating, and realizing that she needs to sleep, takes large doses of sleep aids, and lying in bed, tries to tell herself to fall asleep. There are lots of Easter eggs in here related to Poe, beginning with a box of a gold bug on it. The gold bug was one of Poe's most successful stories and earned him $100 in 1843 which is about $3,400 in modern times. Tamerlane keeps seeing versions of herself in the hallway and around the house. She even sees Verna replacing herself in photos. Roderick recites a line from Poe's Dream Within a Dream. All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. And Gordon Pym mentions that he is having Richard Parker for dinner. Richard Parker is the name of a character in the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, who the story's protagonist, Gordon Pym, eats while on a voyage at sea. Madeline speaks the line, Men have called me mad, from Poe's story Eleonora. Roderick's granddaughter Lenore is watching the 1961 version of The Pit in the Pendulum on TV with her recovering mother. The Pit and the Pendulum is a story by Poe published in 1842, which has been adapted to film on multiple occasions. The theme of the episode is to save the family reputation with the Gold Bug product line. In a way, this bears some similarity to Poe's story, where the Gold Bug in the story is also key to restoring the lead character's fortune. The Gold Bug was published in 1843 as a two-part series in the Philadelphia Dollar newspaper. Poe originally sold the story to Graham's Magazine for $52, about $1,700 in today's value. Later, Poe heard about a writing contest held by the Philadelphia Dollar, the grand prize being $100, so Poe asked Graham's if he could buy the story back and enter the contest. It paid off, and he won the $100, giving him renown and financial success. The Gold Bug begins with an anonymous narrator, learning that his old friend, William Legrand, has lost his fortune and has been behaving strange since his encounter with a mysterious gold bug. Legrand lived with a man named Jupiter. According to Jupiter, Legrand was bitten by a mysterious gold bug. Jupiter believed the bug to be made of solid gold, and after the bite began to behave erratically ever since. Jupiter says that Legrand has become obsessed with gold, even dreaming of it. Legrand has made a drawing of the bug and seemed to be obsessed with guarding the parchment that he used to sketch the insect. The trio set out to find the treasure that Legrand seeks. Given the similarities to the show, it's only fair to compare William Wilson as well, which was first published in Burton's Gentleman's Magazine in 1839. The story begins with William Wilson narrating the story of his childhood. There was a boy in school with the same name and birthday who was just as clever as he was. This irritated the narrator because the other kids would often confuse the two as well as their possessions. The two seem to have lives that mirror one another, and even as they entered adulthood, the copy seemed to follow Wilson everywhere, plaguing him at every turn, even falsely revealing him to be a cheat at a card game, getting the narrator kicked out of the prestigious Oxford University. Four deaths in a row is not a coincidence. 
We don't need to know how it's happening to know it's happening. We are under attack. And if that doesn't snap you out of this, remember, Vic had a board seat. Oh, now you're listening. Yes, brother dear. Has it not occurred to you that if these coincidences keep happening, that family firewall you've always talked about is being dismantled one brick at a time. With the death of Victorine, there is now no doubt that these fatalities are intentional. The ushers know that someone or something is hunting them. They are aware that Verna is closely connected, and now they need to find her. Madeline tells Roderick that his family wall is being dismantled brick by brick, a reference to the cask of Amontillado, where the antagonist, Fortunato, is buried alive inside of a brick wall. At the scene of Victorine's death, Pym is there with the police, ensuring that all of the intellectual property of Fortunato is protected when he stumbles upon an important clue, a copy of Verna's driver's license. Verna's license has some very Poe-related references, starting with her name, Pamela Clem. Clem was the last name of Poe's mother-in-law. The address is 1849 Reynolds. Poe died in 1849, and while on his deathbed, was uttering the name Reynolds over and over again. Even her birthday, January 19th, happens to be the birthday of Edgar Allan Poe. In Poe's version of The Gold Bug, Legrand, Jupiter, and the narrator embark on a mission through the forest of the island at night. They are looking for a giant tulip tree with a very long branch that has a skull on it. They are to tie a string to the gold bug and drop it through the eye of the skull. Then, 50 feet from it, the treasure will be buried. The treasure they are looking for is the buried treasure of Captain Kidd, estimated to be worth $1.5 million, or about $50 million in today's dollars. Poe based some of his story on real events. Captain Kidd was commissioned to fight the Buccaneers and later became a pirate himself. He was captured in Boston and was tried and convicted in London. When he was hanged, the rope broke and he had to be hanged for a second time, earning him notoriety and popularity after his death. Later, part of his treasure was found on Gardner's Island off the coast of New York State, but it was widely believed that the rest of his treasure was buried elsewhere. In the story, after they find the treasure, Legrand explains that the paper he drew the gold bug on had an encrypted message on it, drawn with invisible ink. Poe used a substitution cipher with seemingly random characters. Revealed when held to the fire, Legrand was able to decode the message, which read, A good glass in the bishop's hostel in the devil's seat, 41 degrees and 13 minutes northeast by north. Main branch, seventh limb east side, Shoot from the left eye of the death's head. A beeline from the tree through the shot 50 feet out. The real life Edgar Allan Poe was a very worthy cryptographer. While he was at the Alexander Weekly Messenger, he claimed to have solved every cipher sent to him. The gold bug was influential in its own right. Leo Marx, a codebreaker for Britain during World War II, cites the gold bug as the inspiration for his career in codebreaking. How much do you know about Arthur Pym? I expect he's the kind of man you call if you, I don't know, accidentally kill a prostitute and need to dismember the corpse. <laughs> no, 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 he's not nearly that boring. I have... <laughs> Roderick tells Dupin the story of Arthur Gordon Pym and his adventures sailing around the world. The story he recounts is from the only novel Poe ever wrote the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. The novel tells of Pym sailing around the world and cannibalizing a man named Richard Parker. Arthur finds the address on Verna's license. It is the house the Usher twins grew up in. Pym digs up photos of Verna. She's been associated with some of the wealthiest individuals in history, dating back to the 19th century. Something seems off, resembling the supernatural. Thank you, thank you so much. I am so grateful that we're all here together today to celebrate Goldbug. As you will see tonight, Goldbug is the height of opulence in some... What are you doing here? Tamerlane sees Verna on stage, wearing the same outfit that she is wearing. 
a version of herself. The concept of a doppelganger is a nod to Poe's William Wilson, a theme throughout the episode. Instead of a night of success, Tamerlane spends the evening countering the actions of her alter self, played by Verna. Pictures of her are replaced with pictures of Verna. Her husband is with her. She sees her in the audience. Tamerlane even gets violent, trying to throw a microphone stand at her, only to hit Juno, Roderick's wife, in the head. When Madeline tries to confront Verna, Verna evaporates. This greatly resembles Poe's William Wilson. In his story, Wilson interacts with the narrator his entire life, beginning in his childhood. Having the same name and likeness, Wilson finds his doppelganger to be a nuisance at first. As they progress through life, things get more serious. One night while playing cards, Wilson is winning, beating everyone, but in particular, one individual for whom he knew was down on his luck. Wilson took his money anyway, since the guy was a lousy card player. Just then, a man walks in the room dressed as Wilson and wearing the same coat. He demands the other players check the pockets of Wilson's coat. When they do, they find several face cards, the tactics of a cheater. Wilson was set up. It was the doppelganger's coat, yet he was blamed. Wilson was kicked out of Oxford and disgraced. Years later, Wilson finds his doppelganger one last time and draws his sword for a duel. As they clash, he passes by a mirror and behold, it was himself all along. The doppelganger and Wilson are the same. There was no one to blame for his misfortune but himself. Tamerlane arrives home, humiliated by Verna. She keeps seeing her and chasing her around the house with a fire poker. Much like the sword fight at the end of Poe's story, the battle is with herself. There are mirrors everywhere, resembling the final scene in William Wilson, a foreshadowing that the real enemy lies within. She chases Verna around the house, swinging at her with the poker, breaking every mirror she sees her in. Finally, she swings at the mirror on the ceiling, the glass crashes on top of her, ending the life of Roderick's second oldest child. The glass crashes on top of her, ending the life of Roderick's second oldest child. Maybe I've been living all this time shoved to a dark corner of her skull, and I've spent 40 years growing tiny little tendrils into your brain. I'm finally taking over. Nah, no, I'm kidding. I'm actually you. Well, that wraps up episode five, The Gold Bug, and puts in perspective many of the similarities and differences between the original story by Edgar Allan Poe and the Netflix rendition. Although the episode has many differences compared to Poe's story, it does share many structural similarities and enough Poe references to keep you on your toes. What do you think? Which do you like better? Did you catch any Easter eggs we didn't talk about? Tune in when we break down and compare the next episode with the original text from Poe and point out more Easter eggs. Hint, there are many. Thanks for watching.